I'm Sylvia Odak. I'm a professor here at ISMC. I would like to also welcome you all uh, to this e event. Uh, this is, as David mentioned, the first event that we organized as part of SMC's uh, governance programs dialogues uh, seminar series. This is also, I believe, the first public event introducing the project uh, on gender and, and governance in Muslim contexts. Uh, the project itself uh, takes Din Skandioti's book, Women, Islam and the State, as its point of departure. The book was published in 1991 and has been very influential in the study of gender and Muslim, uh, gender and women in Muslim contexts and beyond has been widely read and referred and, and debated. Today we're going to listen and discuss why 25 years after its publication it is vital, necessary, important to revisit the main themes and arguments of the book and of the original debate that evolved uh, around it. So our first speaker is Catherine Spalman. Catherine is associate professor here at the ISMC and also currently a visiting scholar at Columbia University's uh, Middle East Institute. And she's going to introduce first the governance program and then tell us about how the, uh, uh, the project uh, began. Okay, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be back here after being gone for a year and a half. Um, so I'd like to start by offering just a brief background, um, not only to this panel event, but also the related workshop, which starts tomorrow morning, and it's held on Saturday as well. Um, that's called Gender and Governance in Muslim Context. So I want to talk about how this all first emerged. Um, so this project falls under the realm of the governance program, uh, and the program was set up uh, in 2014 by Professor um, Professor Abdul Falali Ansari. It's currently being run by Gianluca um, Paradin and it's supported by Charlotte, Dr. Charlotte Whiting, um, who's been really um, pivotal in making this all happen. Now, in 2014, at that time, uh, in the shadow of the protests and the uprisings in North Africa and the Middle East region, the stifling of social and political movements and the conflicts, the violence, and the contradictions that have ensued, we felt it to be an important time to think about governance critically at large in its various manifestations, um, so including global governance bodies, NGOs, state apparatuses, religious authority, businesses, and so forth. Now, the initial phase of the program, three separate but interrelated areas emerged for consideration. First, the question of political legitimacy, considering how enduring historical and contemporary divides are resolved. Second, ethical questions surrounding fairness, social justice, and transparency. And third, issues of efficiency, um, so often addressed uh, as matters of development, conflict resol um, resolution, and just finding solutions to various problems. Now, to date, the governance program has been engaging in these three areas, particularly in relation to changing models of political organization, mainly in the Middle East and North African region. So before honing in on Muslim-majority societies, I think it's worth stating an obvious point, namely that the same types of questions, so concerning political legitimacy, ethics and principles, transparency and issues and efficiency, are framing discussions about governance apparatuses around the world, certainly not only in the Middle East and North Africa. And indeed, at the moment, all eyes are on the United States. Uh, without a doubt, Trump's new regime of governance, <coughs> the dismantling of custom state processes, and the peculiar manner in which he and his team make decisions are in the spotlight not only in the US, but at the, the world at, at large, and are raising very serious questions um, and worries. Another point is that what we're going to argue today is that governance apparatuses are very much tied to gender ideologies, gender relations, and gender issues everywhere in the world. And the way they intersect can be far-reaching. So again, Trump supplies a good example by reinstating a policy which prohibits American foreign aid to health providers abroad who discuss abortion as a family planning option. 
So he made it more difficult for women to get access to health care worldwide. And this was just three weeks in office. So that during the events hosted by the governance pro um, program to date, the intersection between gender issues and governance apparatuses and the local and wider implications continue to emerge during the lectures and discussions that we held. For example, we've had a wide range of workshops and lectures um, that have focused on, on constitutions. For instance, in Tunisia, Egypt, Turkey, Bahrain, Iran, Palestine, and other locations, in relation to religious authority, customary laws and practices, the place of religious and ethnic minority groups, the role of international bodies and their expectations. Throughout these conversations, they all raised questions on gender, sexuality, and body politics. We therefore felt the need for a more focused discussion that centered on gender concerns. Now, turning to a different corner of our institute, we found parallel conversations about the role of gender taking place. Dr. Farouk Topan, who's on our faculty, um, organized a meeting to brainstorm some ideas for forthcoming volumes in our publication series called Exploring Muslim Contexts, which is in collaboration with Edinburgh University Press. So he invited um, several uh, scholars, including Denise Kandioti, uh, Professor Aziz Azmei, Ruba Saleh at SOAS, as well as several of our faculty members based here at ISMC, to help identify salient themes and entry points into the complicated social and political dynamics of our times um, in the MENA region and beyond. So after a robust discussion on the predicament and limitations of the category nation state, the disarticulation of governance apparatuses, the displacement of people, and the rise of transnational movements and the new types of actors who are operating under the banner of Islam. It was argued at that meeting that it was imperative to rethink both current methodologies and existing categories of analysis. So it's emphasized, for instance, that gender be viewed as a key lens through which to address issues, such as how politics are enacted through such sexual control. So Denise, Candioti's seminal volume, Women, Islam, and the State, first published 26 years ago now, was brought into that discussion. And it was put forth as a fascinating way to think and rethink the categories of the past in relation to the present, and operationalized the exploration of what was referred to as the system, systematic disarticulation of governance apparatuses. So after reading um, the report from that meeting, and knowing the important gap to fill in the governance program, I contacted Nadia Ali at SOAS, um, as we were both students of Denise's. And I had a feeling she'd be very interested in this project as well. So Denise, Nadia, and I have met on several occasions um, and have been re working on the, the themes and uh, the concepts um, for this project. And then we invited um, a group of really dynamic scholars to join us in, in creating a volume to revisit the Denise's seminal work. So, um, and just to the, give you an idea of the, of the countries that we're covering in the, in the volume, uh, we're covering Palestine, um, Kurdish territories, Tunisia, Egypt, Afghanistan, Iran, Bangladesh, um, and uh, Najee is going to focus on Iraq, and Denise will focus on Turkey, and I'm going to focus on the so-called Muslim diaspora. So with no more further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Denise to talk about the conceptual framework of our project. Thank you. Make no mistake, it's the perseverance of people like Catherine, Nadia, the prospect of working with my PhD students again, with Isla, with Heba, that brought me out of deepest retirement. <laughs> Uh, but as to our question, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Now, as to the question that is before us today, is gender a governance issue? It seems quite straightforward to respond in the affirmative. After all, if we define governance as the exercise of political authority and the use of institutional resources 
to manage society, it is quite plain that all regulations around gender and sexuality and the family are ultimately governance issues. Whether we're speaking about gendered welfare and labor policies, abortion and reproductive rights, new reproductive technologies, LGBT rights, same-sex marriage, adoption rights, and I could go on. These issues are everywhere not only highly politicized, but also bitterly divisive. So then, what was special about gender and governance in Muslim contexts when we embarked on our project Women, Islam and the State all those years ago? Well, first, an implicit assumption that when it comes to Muslim-majority countries, there was a potential built-in governance blueprint deriving from the Sharia, especially in relation to the status of women and women's rights. The extensive literature on the historicity of Muslim laws, on the diversity of schools of jurisprudence, of the various histories of secularization of legal systems, seemed to have very little impact. We were locked in what I call the special relationship, not between the UK and the United States, no, <laughs> but between women and Islam. The field was dominated by assumptions that women's rights could be read off holy texts and Muslim jurisprudence. And it is in order to break this particular conceptual deadlock that we embarked on women, Islam, and the state. Now, looking back, I realized that we were working with a handful of key variables. First, we considered the ways in which post-colonial nationalisms had incorporated Islam into diverse processes of nation building with various dif different outcomes, with countries like Tunisia and Turkey at one end of the continuum and Saudi Arabia at the other end. Second, we analyzed the manner in which Islam served as a discourse of cultural authenticity and identity. And our three case studies on Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Muslim India were absolutely instructive on how it works very differently indeed in these different contexts. Third, we probed into the manner in which and the extent to which state interventions into sub-national domains, into the domains of tribe, family, and community, vary. So Zouad, Zouad Joseph contrasted the case of Ba'ath East Iraq with its centralized structure with multi-confessional Lebanon. And previously, Munira Sharad had done brilliant work comparing Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, showing that a lot of the differences in their legal system stem from this very reason. And finally, we looked at the effects of the entanglements of states and women's movements with global governance institutions and with aid donors. For instance, we looked at how a country like Bangladesh was simultaneously accepting US aid money while it was also taking Saudi aid, which worked exactly in the opposite direction. They were getting US aid money for family planning and distributing Saudi tracts on the family, etc., etc., simultaneously. So, by the end of the project, I think we had satisfactorily demonstrated that what is at stake here was not religion per se, but it's how it intertwines with systems of rule. Now, you might say this is not a very original thought because this applies to just about any context. I think we can all appreciate the, difference, the differences between what it means to be a pious Catholic in Spain and what it is to have church attendance monitored by the Guardia Civil, the police, under Franco. Likewise, we know what it means to have Muslim dress codes monitored by special police forces, as is the case in Saudi Arabia and in Iran. 
we had, of course, no way of projecting into a future where a wave of global neoliberal restructuring from the 1980s would transform governance and citizenship contracts between state and society completely, nor that this would eventually lead to the collapse of entrenched authoritarian regimes such as those in Egypt and Tunisia in the aftermath <coughs> of the Arab uprisings in 2011. Nor could we anticipate that some of the unitary states of the Middle East and North Africa would fragment and fail to survive as sovereign entities as a result of regime change, occupation and conflict, as is the case of Iraq, Libya, Syria and before that indeed Afghanistan. Likewise, we could not have anticipated how Islam would morph into a security issue after the terrorist attacks of 9-11 and how it, be it would become eventually implicated in debates about multiculturalism and democratic governance in Western countries, which now have sizable Muslim diasporas further augmented by refugee flows. As scholars, having been sharply critical about the simplifying assumptions of Huntington's clash of civilizations, we are now faced with a US administration whose chief ideologues make it a plank of actual policy. This is bound to have incalculable consequences. It is clear, therefore, that the task that lies before us now is increasingly and immensely more complex, both conceptually and empirically, as we embark on our new project. First, ironically, more than 25 years on, we appear to have come full circle to privileging Islam as the key analytic category, albeit in very different terms and in response to very different conjunctures. The securitization of discourses around Islam and Muslims have initiated yet another sterile round of debates about what constitutes or does not constitute real Islam, often eliding a sustained discussion of the political dynamics that give Islamic movements or their opponents their meaning and content. Our conceptual horizon on questions of Islam and women's rights have been dominated and I believe constricted by the consequences of military interventions of Western powers following the 9-11 events and the ensuing war on terror. I consider that the combined effects of opportunistic championing of women's rights as a justification of armed interventions and of donor packages meant to empower women in post-conflict countries such as Iraq and Afghanistan led to questioning the links between imperialism and feminism. Harking back to very long ago when we were talking about the effects of colonialism and uh, women's movements related to that. There were several strands to this critique and they were mutually reinforcing. An important strand that predated 9-11 derived from Talal Assad's critique of Western secularism interpreted as part of the apparatus of the cultural hegemony of the West. This approach revived the debates on questions of feminist agency and its allied tropes of resistance put on the agenda by Mahmoud's work on piety in Egypt, uh, suggesting that there are different registers of selfhood and agency that then than those predicted by feminist theory and its alleged liberal roots. Broadly speaking, this fed into the so-called post-secular term in feminism, which while it opened avenues for critiques of the West, 
totally disregarded the costs of locking an assumed non-Western other into an essentialist realm of radical difference with no room or very little room for the interrogation of arbitrary authorities and the inequalities they maintain. In plain language, the struggles <coughs> of women's movements of all stripes with the patriarchal orders they are subjected to were either brushed out of the picture or worse, delegitimized. Another strand of critique emanated from critical legal theory and suggested that feminist norms and values have gained institutional traction internationally, most notably in the development of international criminal law aimed at persecuting sexual violence. The term governance feminism came to signify a reliance on state-centered forms of power and the promotion of a politics of respectability and, and political correctness that criminalizes and marginalizes certain practices and subjectivities. This, of course, turned patriarchy on its head by suggesting that the top-down enforcement of women's rights had itself <coughs> become an oppressive governance practice. And indeed, a middle class, a class practice, whereby it was argued, for example, in the case of Egypt, that middle class women's NGOs are in cahoots with the security state to criminalize working class masculinities. Translated into Muslim contexts, this meant that women's movements and sexual rights platforms making references to international standard setting instruments, often as a bargaining chip in their negotiations with their governments, as was the case in Afghanistan, where women's movements were pressing for SEDO, <coughs> they could be dubbed as fellow travelers and conveyors of this oppressive neoliberal order. Admittedly, the incorporation of women's movements into donor-funded machineries in our neoliberal age produced an NGOization, and there I refer to Islam, because I believe she coined the term, of political movements, with women's NGOs often acting as contractors for governments and for donors. This led to the de-radicalization of their objectives, which were now transformed into technocratic fixes for the so-called empowerment of women. This, however, left women's movements in an impasse and indeed, Nadia Ali is going to address after me the important question of how to deal with these challenges and what alternative modes of claim making and mobilization <coughs> are available to you. Before we move on, however, there are several myths that we need to dispel. The first is the alleged hegemony of a liberal world order. <coughs> We could start with the United Nations, which has been at the forefront of promoting conventions like CEDO, the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and also all sorts of other instruments and machineries in the field of gender equality. On February 3, 2015, Belarus, Egypt, and Qatar launched the group of Friends of the Family, which has as its members, among others, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the Holy See, and numerous African countries. Their main objectives are to claw back the rights it took the United Nations over four decades to achieve. We cannot overlook the fact that there are powerful transnational alliances cutting across continents and world regions, aiming above all to establish the principles 
that matters relating to sexuality, the control of bodies, and reproductive choice do not belong to the sphere of civic deliberation, public choice, or human rights, but to a non-negotiable domain defined by doctrinal imperatives. And now the United States is joining that mainstream. I say mainstream. It was always assumed, wasn't it, that the mainstream was liberal. Well, it is not. That's my news, my first news. Another uh, piece of news, well, it's not to me, but whenever I give talks, people seem surprised by that, is that we must re-examine the alleged secularity of states in the Middle East, North Africa, South Asia. While the nature of the nation-building moment is open to debate, in my view, although I would suggest that even in countries like Turkey, we could have a long debate about you know, whether secularism was a foundational principle, etc. Certainly, the unraveling of post-independent social compacts in the years following economic liberalization and privatization policies witness the descent of many authoritarian states into dynastic rule and crony capitalism. Many regimes use conservative Islamism as a means to contain and neutralize more radical tendencies and promoted various forms of state-sponsored religiosity. We are dealing, therefore, with political fields that were already deeply permeated by religious influences. It would be quite erroneous, for instance, to define the regime in Egypt prior to the, to the Arab uprisings as secular. One only has to remember that it was state courts that passed the judgment of takfir, apostasy, on a scholar like Hamid Nasr Abu Zaid, forcing him to, to divorce his wife on those grounds. Likewise, playing the religious card was even deployed by the allegedly secular Turkish military after they seized power in a coup in 1980. They built upon the already well-developed infrastructure of the Cold War years, geared to promoting Islam as an antidote to communism, in order to shift from state secularism to a new official ideology, the Turkish Islamic synthesis, placing Islam at the center of national identity. In other words, by the time the Islamist parties came to power, a lot of the groundwork was already there. I would just like to conclude that the public presence of religion was greatly enhanced, both, and this is the problem, both as a populist legitimating discourse of state elites and as the language of opposition to them. I think this is what is so confusion, confusing, that you know, these lame attempts of you know, talking about Islamist oppositional movements versus so-called secular states completely, I think, obfuscates the issue. Time does not permit me to elaborate further on other concepts, but it is clear that terms like secularism, Islam, liberalism, and even feminism can become straitjackets, which often fetter our understanding of the dynamics on the ground. We hope that our focus on governance will bring politics back in. I think that, well, this is a parenthesis, but I can't help feeling that the post-structuralist term in gender studies has done undoubtedly a great deal to problematize the concept of gender, but its relentless focus on identities, sexualities, and the body has sapped a great deal of energy away from setting the political in its institutional and historical context. Having said that, what do we want to do? What are we hoping to do? We want to answer some key questions. First, what are the links between systems of rule and regulations around gender? What sorts of femininities and masculinities do these promote and sustain? 
in what ways does geopolitic and conflict impact upon those? What are the arenas of social contention in which civil society and grassroots movements manifest themselves? What sorts of openings and hurdles exist for claim making and mobilization around gender issues? Very importantly, what is the nature of political alliances and mobilization around gender issues? This includes cross-gender and generational alliances mobilizing around women's rights. How do these engage with mobilizations around class, race, and ethnicity? As you can see, we have a very full agenda, but we thought we would share some of those with you today. So thanks for coming. Thank you, Denise, for this very comprehensive and fascinating survey of the key debates and uh, conceptual and theoretical discussions in the last 25 years. I just realized that we failed to introduce you, but luckily you don't need an introduction, so, <laughs> as the whole project is based on her book and her, her scholarship. So our third speaker is Nadia. Nadia is a professor in gender studies at SOAS, University of London, and she will be talking about, again, the key teams and especially the cases and the women's movements involved in the project. Thank you. Well, um, I always... Uh, I find it very intimidating to speak after Denise, who of course in a very characteristic manner provides us a very sort of complex um, theoretical conceptual framework, but also really goes to the heart of the matter. So I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that Denise already mentioned, but my specific focus is the issue of feminist mobilization, how it might have changed. So when I did my PhD with Denise in the 90s, uh, in the mid 90s, um, sort of the themes that uh, we were all interested in were sort of questions around uh, various forms of independent versus dependent uh, mobilization, sort of the role of state feminism. Uh, there, were, there was quite a bit of scholarship that was interested in Islamic feminism and the kind of continuum of secular towards uh, and Islamist mobilization. And then, of course, uh, scholars uh, a little bit later on, uh, like Isla Jad and also Shazad Mujab, uh, very much uh, spoke about what Denise already coined, the NGOization uh, of um, feminist mobilization. And I have to say, I myself initially um, sort of uh, looking at both the Egyptian context and also uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, actually uh, felt that um, it was a bit more nuance in the sense that I felt that some um, organizations, some activists uh, were still quite radical despite the fact that there was injurization happening. Uh, and I have to admit I was uh, critical, initially a bit critical of uh, Shazad's uh, work in the context of Iraqi Kurdistan, but, but after some years I totally agreed with him. <laughs> <laughs> So I think sort of um, initially I was sort of more multi, um, well it was my idealism that I think was sort of uh, guiding me, but um, I saw the sort of impact of uh, NGOization but also of international funding, uh, which was quite devastating in the Iraqi Kurdish context and um, where sort of very neoliberal concepts of empowerment and women's leadership were just not questioned, but they were just sort of... Um, you know, followed and uh, lots of money from very dubious sources like USAID or the International Republican Institute is actually parachuted into the Iraqi context. But of course, Iraq was not alone there. Um, now, um, I, uh, in terms of more recent developments, I think it's really important. I was asked a lot after the protest, the initial protest in 2011, uh, lots of people asked me about the sudden mobilization of women in the region. And I always had to come back, well, this is not sudden, you know, there's a history of mobilization. And I think one of the problems, certainly when it comes to, I guess, sort of a more popular media and policy discourse is this presentism. I mean, we don't historicize. And that's, that's really problematic. So that's why I think it's so important to have this 
um, this longer historical lens. Looking at more recent uh, developments, um, I actually uh, slightly uh, would challenge Denise's um, sort of conceptualization of uh, body politics as not, as not being political. I mean, I share Denise's concern about kind of post-structuralist turn and that there has been lots of scholarship that very much focuses on representation and discourse and leaves out political economy and material conditions, which is very, very problematic. But I do think that, um, you know, sexuality, uh, body politics and even identity are extremely political, but we need to also situate them in very specific political and economic contexts. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, certainly I, like many others, have been very critical of this whole idea of Facebook revolutions. Um, but it is important to recognize that online activism has contributed to the emergence of new forms of activism amongst uh, young men and women whose um, sort of gender-based activism is often linked to wider struggles of citizenship and human rights. And I feel we've kind of come full circle in this context uh, again, because when I um, interviewed Egyptian women's rights activists in the 90s about sort of their involvement in women's rights activism, many of them told me that they started out as part of wider political movements, so student movement, leftist political movement, uh, of course, in the region, when we look more broadly, there's a whole history of nationalist movements, liberation movements. Uh, and then at some point down the line, women felt that they were delegated to the roles of making tea, or that they were sort of marginalized within the movement. So we had this, the emergence of the women-only organizations uh, and movements. Uh, I find that the, the new generation uh, of feminists who are active now, whether when I look to Egypt or Iraq or, or Turkey, they're much more open to work again with men. Um, and they're also, you know, uh, in terms of alliances, much more open to, to build alliances. But having said that, when a young feminist who are involved in Nazra in Egypt, for example, told me that initially they're very eager to work with men, uh, but after a couple of years, now they started to feel a bit disillusioned and they sort of started to actually retreat. But I think one of the big changes that I can see uh, in the region, we have of course all these horrible accounts of harassment, again particularly in, in the context of Egypt. But what we have also for the first time is that young men stand up side by side with women recognizing that the struggle against gender-based violence, the struggle against sexual violence, the struggle against harassment is not a side issue, but it is very much at the center of their struggle against political authoritarianism. We, I think we've seen that in, in Turkey, we've seen that uh, in Egypt, and to a lesser extent, but to some extent, in Iraq. So while young men are, of course, um, you know, very much uh, at the forefront of perpetrating gender-based violence, they are also at the forefront of actually challenging the very uh, system, the very uh, gender regime, um, you know, that, that is uh, implicated in, in authoritarianism. Um, another point uh, that uh, I think is really important, again, when we, you know, speak about this is, of course, one thing, uh, that I think makes uh, Denise's work so powerful is that she always uh, reminds us that we need to look back at political economy. And so even harassment, I think, when we discuss harassment, I think that's why some of the, um, the narratives around harassment are so problematic, because they don't actually look at uh, you know, issues around, uh, first of all, wider forms of violence, uh, but also uh, uh, normalization of violence, whether in terms of torture, uh, the torture of men and women at the hands of the authorities, uh, widespread executions in Egyptian prisons, uh, extrajudicial uh, punishments and executions. But I think it's also really important to look beyond um, gang attacks and tackle wider forms of sexual harassment, linking it to domestic violence, marital rape, FGM, honor-based crimes and killings. And as many Egyptian feminists have also suggested, to make the connection um, and to have a more long-term and holistic strategy against harassment, we really need to include a campa campaign for fairer economic redistribution, uh, which would include a campaign against neoliberal economic policies, and crucially as well, 
a campaign against the systematic marginalization of women in decision-making processes. Um, but I think really uh, very importantly the centrality of body politics is not only articulated through the bodies of women but also through the bodies of men and more specifically man sexuality. And so, you know, this uh, so targeting of men who do not fit the norm, and I'm speaking here about heteronormativity, is really important and it's something, again, we've seen very much in Turkey, we've seen it very much in Iraq and in Egypt. Um, and uh, as many of us have argued many times, heteronormativity is central to militarism, it is central to authoritarianism, and it's very much part of the backlash against a radical social and political transformation. So actually I do think that it's important to speak about sexuality and that it's, you know, it's, it's very, um, it's political. And finally, uh, I would just uh, like to say that um, even in the 90s, uh, many of us started to challenge the quite simplistic division between secular and religious. Um, in my own work, I try to look at the continuum of secular <coughs> versus religious mobilization in the Egyptian context. Um, but uh, I think now what is really, well, much more significant is the sectorianization of gender issues. And this is particularly the case uh, in Iraq where debates about the personal status code are really fought along sectarian lines. And we see it also in the context of Lebanon. And I think that's something, of course, sectarianism is not new. It existed in the 90s, uh, but it's now institutionalized and it's much more widespread and it's much more internalized. And maybe uh, just to conclude, uh, I think many of us, uh, precisely for the, the many reasons that uh, Denise uh, mentioned, were engaged in the project of challenging uh, what Denise has called the culturalization of gender issues. Sort of the idea that it's because of their culture, it's because of their religion, it's because of Islam, uh, that you know, we find certain forms of uh, inequalities and oppression. So myself, uh, in my work with Nicola Pratt in the context of Iraq and the invasion of Iraq and occupation and sanctions, uh, we very much stressed the impact of colonialism, the impact of the invasion, the impact of um, imperialism more broadly. But I have to say I can't have come um, to a point where I just feel it is not good enough anymore mm -hmm. to just point at just imperialism isn't. to explain in 2016 the wide range of forms of inequalities and forms of expression and different sources of gender-based violence. And I think that although we are, of course, at an extremely difficult historical moment where racism and Islamophobia is so rampant, but I don't think we should be given in to the tendency to just sort of push back and not actually name the local and regional sources of um, oppression and inequality. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Is this working? Yes. I think it's better that we continue from here. Thank you all for introducing this very interesting, timely, and fascinating uh, project. We have a lot of issues in our basket to discuss. I think now the floor is open for questions and comments. Uh, I think it's better if we collect a few questions and then turn to our, our panelists. Any questions, comments? Yes, please. Just a question on the um, NGOization of uh, women's movements and uh, feminist movements. So in, in cases where you might um, have women's movements, particularly, um, I'm thinking about Afghanistan, but possibly other cases where members of the women's movement are actually kind of responding back to that uh, critique and saying, um, well, actually, I think it maybe comes from a fear of losing their funding, but they're sort of responding back to the critique and saying, uh, just to clarify, we very much want uh, international donor funding and want to make sure that uh, no one's concerned about whether we're still legitimate representatives of the women's movement, we're committed and we want the funding. Um, how do you respond to that and how do you sort of engage that kind of Thank you. Yes, please. Should we get a few questions? Let me first yeah. Yeah. take a few questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, I'm particularly wanting to understand yeah, sure. just a minute, yeah. Um, I see that the conversation is very much at the macro level. Uh, I'm interested in the micro level. Uh, and my interest comes because I work with refugee women in London. 
who are engaging in on the marriages, gender violence, and arriving into the asylum process. And what I'm seeming to understand from the little reading that I've done, that although the Hudud, Hudud um, 1979 rule uh, for some kind of, um, the government put that rule, and then it was re, uh, it was re, um, theorized, or it was, it was made it stronger or whatever in 2006. Yet it seems to me that within uh, groups, in, lo in localities, nobody is actually uh, following those rules that the government has put. Which government? Think, Are you talking about Pakistan? Pakistan. Okay. Pakistan. All Pakistan. Yep. So I'm wondering whether uh, local communities, families, because of the Jadavari and the Izzat issue, still carry on in their norms, irrespective <coughs> of what the government is putting in place, almost ignoring it. So. The question I have is yet, yes, you are talking at macro level, but because of the culture, because of the embodied way of being that these people have lived for God knows how many years, can they shift? Uh -huh. So when I talk to the girl, they say, Nasimaji, don't even bother. These men are not going to change. Forget the beliefs. <laughs> so I just wanted to see what mm -hmm. you say. Thank you. We can have one more question. <coughs> Jada, did you have a question? Um, Jonathan? Can we have a microphone? Yeah. Sorry. Um, thank, you, uh, thank you very much for the um, interesting presentations. Just uh, wanted to hear more about the um, new mainstream um, and um, a little bit about the old mainstream as well, which um, historically came with all sorts of internal inconsistencies, mm. inconsistencies uh, to begin with. So just, you know, it's, it's a large question. So shall we do the first round? Mm -hmm. Who wants to start? That's so the angelization question. <coughs> yeah, I can say something about that, but why don't you start? Why don't you start? Okay, if you want me to. Uh, because I know a little bit about Afghanistan, I think, is this working? Yes. I think it's not just the question of women's movements. When you look at these rights issues, you have to look at the political blocks involved, okay? So you can't leave the men out of the picture. <laughs> so what I would like to know is which groups of men, for example, are supporting a particular legislative amendment in favor of women and which men are opposing them. So when you look at the Afghanistan parliament, you see very interesting constellations around these issues. So I think it would be a great mistake to isolate the question of women's rights from the more general, uh, you know, because the women's rights thing almost became a kind of passwords for the Mujahideen parties blocking things. And the women often, because they're also members of factions, please, I mean, one of the things that really uh, bothers me about talking about women's movements is there is some assumption that women are articulating gender interests. They are as divided as the men politically, and they are as factionalized. So you have to map on. There is a map that is missing, that is mapping on the women and the women's NGOs and their demands, and how this fits in with the constellation of the political field of that particular country. That's why I think, you know, Yes, in places like Iraq, I can see that the uh, prospects for corruption are endless, you know. But generally speaking, you know, there is, there is a political balancing act. And right now, there are, in Turkey, a lot of men's groups that are very militantly, <laughs> you know, behind women's rights, and, you know. And we know who Not and a lot of, but yeah. So, oh, come stop. on, come on, Sadie. <laughs> we could have a discussion about that. So, moving on to the uh, question of culture. Uh, of course, when you're talking about governance, you have to take a perspective, a certain perspective. Working, however, at the grassroots doesn't mean that you have to culturalize again, because migrant communities and refugee communities are culturally very influenced by the way in which particular countries manage 
multiculturalism and diversity. So when you come to England, I always wondered why it is that Muslim women here go to Sharia. Um, they're not courts as such, but they are Sharia courts in order to get their divorce. And it's quite clear that be because it's because of the Church of England. I didn't know that. I only just discovered that the Church of England recognizes as uh, civil marriages Christian and Jewish marriages. They have an agreement, but not Muslim marriages. Okay? So therefore, which is fine, you can have a nikah, but then you have a problem when you need to divorce. So, you know, you have to find a way of divorcing. Now, this does not mean that there are a lot of women who want to go through the Sharia court. You know, I don't know enough about it. I just found out literally a couple of weeks ago about this. Um, so when you're looking at these communities, don't just assume, oh, you know, this is culture. Because the way in which cultures express themselves in their own countries and the diaspora can be very different. Can I, just, can I just add on to that question? Yes, please. Um, what came to my mind when you were talking is, is a question of leadership and who the women see as their leader in terms of religious leader or community leader. And, and this is very complicated. And if you look at the, the history of, of leadership that emerged in the UK over the years um, and that were, because there was a need to have a Muslim spokesperson in the eyes of the British government. And so there's sort of a competition about who's going to be the voice of the Muslim community, which we, of course, know there's Muslim communities. You know, so there was a lot of power struggles. And, and historically, it tended to be certain groups that tended to be male, first of all, and quite conservative males at that. And, and so there tended to be a big divide in what happened informally in in these networks. And women usually work in informal networks at home and a lot of problem solving took place at home along these lines. And, and then you did have a lot of underground Pakistani and Iranian uh, different networks that would deal with gender issues. Um, but it's been a struggle for them once they started sort of having stepping stones into the public. This has been where it's been more complicated uh, because they might not be recognized by both by both the, the state, the state, the British state, because they think, well, they're not our leaders that we know about. So why should we fund them? You know, we know, we know they're not our people, our go-to Muslims, you know, the British Muslims. And so it's been a real struggle for, for women organizations to, to be seen as credible and to have a voice both in the eyes of Muslim communities and state, I think. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going, uh, I'll come back to the mainstream. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, two points. One related to uh, Denise's point in terms of women are not just um, representing their gendered interests, but also different factions. Uh, yes, uh, definitely, and uh, not only different political factions, but different uh, sectarian uh, class interests and so on. But, uh, I mean, when it comes to gendered interests, I think that there are, I think we need to sort of straddle between essentializing women and also recognizing that there are certain contexts in which there are actually mobilizations that cut across these differences. So yes. when I think about the Iraqi context, I have evidence of both. I have evidence of women who are very much linked to their specific, specific political parties and sects and um, act accordingly. But then we have women, and um, sometimes it's actually the same woman in specific contexts. I mean, it is contextual who uh, might be part so, uh, of a wider alliance. In the Iraqi context, we have the Iraqi Women's Alliance, uh, Shabaka al-Iraqiya, which consists of over 80 women's organizations uh, of different class, ethnic, religious backgrounds, um, who do actually work together. And not only, I mean, who work together on certain issues, let's put it this way. And then they might differ on other issues. Uh, but crucially, they are also very active against authoritarianism and sectarianism. So they're actually quite intersectional. Um, so I just wanted to add that. And then in terms of the question of NGOization, I do feel that I have to make a point to kind of uh, nuance it a bit in the sense that, um, okay, so what are the options if you don't get money from outside? Um, one option is to get it from political parties inside, which is often not a good alternative. And then I would also say that not all funders are the same. 
Uh, so in the Egyptian context in the 90s, they had this sort of the good funders and the bad funders, and they exist in Iraq as well. And uh, often USAID, USAID is on the sort of side of bad funders, and then a sort of Swedish or Canadian organization is on the side of good funders. And it's, of course, linked to political strings attached. And, um, but also, importantly, in terms of agency of women's organizations. I mean, they're not just uh, the passive victims of international agendas, and some are uh, much uh, smarter than others to kind of maneuver their way around certain restrictions. I just wanted to bring that in. I think we've got the mainstream yes. question. The Let, new mainstream. The mainstream. Mm -hmm. I, may I <coughs> confess that I literally made that up. It's not, mm -hmm. even, it's not even in my notes. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm trying to say is this, basically, that, um, you know, setting up a sort of um, never-changing, hegemonic, all-powerful idea of an order doesn't really work. Now, what was the order before? Okay, for a long time, you had a block of countries in the United Nations, which as a result of their internal, uh, their own internal politics, were pushing for an expansion of rights. What that did, I mean, we could look at other institutions in the same optic. What that did is that during several decades where there were UN conferences on women, there were people pushing in a certain direction and achieving certain legal changes to which then states signed on, often with very little effect, it must be said except, by the way, in Turkey, where SEDO compliance was at its peak in 2004, for reasons which have absolutely nothing to do with being liberal. It was pure realpolitik. Now, what happens, though, is that after all these UN conferences, suddenly people are too scared to have a fifth world conference because they know that... <laughs> It's going to be Armageddon as far as all these rights are concerned. Why? Because all the powers that are in ascendance and that are pushing are actually pushing. There was always this lobby. It was there in Cairo. When was the... 1994. In 1994, you know, when there was the population conference. Uh, it, they were there and they were there in force. But what is happening now, you might have noticed, is that there is a wave of right-wing conservatism, which is sweeping <clears throat> all continents, except, I would say, Europe, where you can be a fascist and support gay rights. That's okay. You know, I mean, usually there is a package, you know, where religious conservatism comes, you know, with a heavy dose of sexual conservatism and so on. And yet, we have the spectacle of a um, racist, uh, whole, you know, Dutch politician who's absolutely okay being himself gay, you see. So that's, I would say, the European exception. But generally speaking, not really. I think they exist in the States as well. Some of them. <laughs> yeah, maybe. It's possible. I don't know. Uh, I'm just, I mean, yeah. I'm half joking. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, there are you know, secular changes, where, you know, there is a wave which seems unstoppable, but then you discover it's not. In other words, every gain has to be fought for, basically. That's it. You cannot take it for granted. That's all I meant, really. Yeah. So we have time for a second round of questions and comments. There was a question back there. Yeah? There was another, yeah, here. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, sorry, I was, I was just wondering, like, 
since we're talking about governance in Muslim context. Um, what do we do with those people for whom, I mean, you have touched upon it, but I'm just, in order to kind of invest more into a South-South dialogue that we need in order to challenge existing patriarchal forms of policy making and governance. I'm just wondering, of uh, what do you make of the people who move across, for instance, let's take the Afghan example, um, Afghans traveling and experiencing all the Islamic republics of the re region, maybe being born and raised in Baluchistan, Kuwaita, traveling to Iran, and then coming back to Afghanistan, and then making their way either to the east or back to Pakistan or Iran. So I think looking at governance really, really makes it necessary to look at these traveling citizens <coughs> who are not really linked anymore to one citizenship. And I think this is also what kind of Trump made me personally realize that, like, you know, that basically these people are, sorry my vocabulary, fucked in each of these countries, <laughs> right? And um, what can governance give us when there's no such thing as experienced citizenship for these traveling bodies? that embody on each type of level the violence of these governance, uh, governances. Um, so I think we have to maybe either rethink governance or complicate our engagement with governance by uh, looking at forms of people who are beyond the rule of law mm -hmm. and how they mm -hmm. engage. And literally, like, the system fucks me, I fuck you back. I'm sorry to use all the sexual vocabulary, but I think <laughs> it is really violent, this process. And it is actually very, very sexualizing as well. So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, yes, please. There. Thank you for the good looking presentations. I have two points. Uh, I think we are, maybe most of you agree that we have in post globalism, meaning that we have the Muslim women and the Muslim Could you please speak up? Could you yeah. please stop? Yeah. Um, yeah, keep the microphone close. I'm saying that we, may, maybe most of you agree that we have in post globalism, Muslim, millions of Muslim women living in Middle East and Muslim majority countries, they have access to diverse, cultural diversity, norms from all over the world, and they uh, um, never felt they uh, insist to use a particular cultural identity. So, to what extent do you think that we should go beyond culture as a, a form of identity and deal with it as a resource, as a tool, as a weapon for power maneuvering, particularly um, according to Muslim women experience, Muslim women activist experiences, they have been using uh, Islamic uh, identity as a, a, a tool, a strong weapon uh, for power maneuvering. And second, to what extent through your volume you can use political economy discourse to analyze the authoritarian, the top-down uh, uh, governing approach used by eight uh, international humanitarian aid system, particularly at the current days, if you read all the reports about gendering a uh, Syrian refugee crisis, you see that the same authoritarian gendering approach used by international humanitarian organization is debated. I mean, reflecting on my experience in Gaza, they do the same in Syria with Syrian refugees, they did the same in Pakistan, they did the same in other uh, parts of the world. So how, how can you um, uh, link, you know, uh, the political economy with what's going on? Yeah. What did you What did you Sorry. mean by by um, the, the, the same? The same in the different countries. What What's the same in the different countries? Uh, I, I Is it the top down the, uh, system used by And what is that? Can you specify a little bit? I think the top down trying to use to impose the liberal feminist discourse, the international. Uh, uh, principles of gender equality and gender management into the context of refugees. Of refugees. So, shall we turn to you again? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah I think so. 
Okay, so on the question, what do I mean by um, it's not enough to just speak about imperialism uh, when we talk about Iraq, for example? Um, well, I mean, there are, first of all, uh, aside from um, American and uh, British involvement in Iraq, and I'm not in any way belittling that, uh, and of course it has its place out uh, locally as well and influences local actors, but there are regional actors, I mean, in the Iraqi context, Iran, very importantly, but also Saudi Arabia, Qatar. Uh, and then uh, locally, I mean, I personally hold uh, Iraqi uh, politicians as responsible as the U.S. I mean, they are very much complicit in actually um, uh, institutionalizing sectarianism, in creating one of the worst corruption scandals uh, in history, in uh, creating a situation where Iraq is a totally failed state with no infrastructure. So, um, I mean, there were active agents in that. Uh, and then, aside from the uh, Iraqi politicians, the, the former opposition, uh, you have the various militia, you have the Islamist political parties, whether they're Sunni or Shia, uh, you have a tribal group. I mean, since the 90s, there has been a kind of retribalization in Iraq. Uh, you have the role of uh, extended families, um, criminal gangs. Uh, they have all been sources uh, of uh, gender-based and sectarian violence in the Iraqi context. I think that's mainly what I want to speak. I'll just sort of add on. Um, to answer your question, or really, I mean, it's not a question that's really answerable because you're sort of stating um, a serious problems of people in between, mm -hmm. caught between states. Mm -hmm. And this is happening south-south, and it's happening south-north, and it's happening east-west. And especially now with the visa bans, a Muslim land, whatever you want to call it, it's, 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 going, it's happening a lot through the new laws that, that Western countries are now implementing. Um, and it's a real problem. People are really getting caught between different laws regarding citizenship, and really caught between. And so this is an enormous problem when it comes to governance. And, and I think that's what's happening is a, will be a continuity of what was already happening, and that's more uh, international transnational networks, um, some criminal networks, some you know, not many sectarian that go across, across borders. So border crossings in different ways that are more communal based, um, and which have their own problems and strengths as well. You know, they could be very supportive networks, mm. but they can also have their own ways of viewing gender, their own gender ideologies that go with them as well. So it's a real problem. I think we have to look across nation state borders um, and, and really try to understand how people are going to be caught in new ways between states as well. Yeah. yeah. So do you also want to reflect on the third question? Well, I don't know enough about aid to refugees to comment. I don't know the blueprint. So if someone else is better versed in that, all I know is that a lot of aid comes with strings attached. And people who did studies on what is happening in refugee camps with, uh, with Islamic aid also know that there are conditionalities attached to receiving this aid, like veiling and so on and so forth. So. The problem is that a lot of people who pay money also place conditionalities, whether they're political or economic. I personally think that the conditionalities that are shrugged off most lightly are the gender conditionalities. In practice, what I have seen in Afghanistan and so on is that nobody really gives a toss and they carry on or they make token gestures nothing really changes, whereas the political conditionalities that come, I know of some instances of, you know, Pakistan and what is happening to refugees there, the conditionalities are much heavier and women are monitored in a much more serious manner. So we should do this maybe comparatively, okay, to see, you know, what types, because we always have, you know, the tendency to think of aid as Western aid. And even that Western aid is so broad. For instance, how does Japanese aid operate? Do you know? I know a little bit because I worked in Afghanistan at one point. It's completely different. 
So I really think at this point, I have reached a point where I refuse to speak in general terms. If we're talking about, you know, uh, aid to refugees, I want to see very precisely whose aid, for what purpose, and with what conditionalities. Talking about, you know, the liberal agenda, it doesn't mean anything to me anymore. It's just become a slogan, basically. Can I just add something to that? Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking about this right now. I haven't thought it through. But I, you know, of, 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 of trying to implement sort of a, a, a Western feminism, let's say a, an essentialized idea of a Western Very feminism, better. like imperialist feminism mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. aid. Let's just say that this, you know, okay. And I'm more worried at this point where we are in this day of age that, that there's not going to even be a political will to do that. So mm -hmm. even the rescue narratives of saying we're going to save mm -hmm. the Muslim women, I think we're at that point that we're going to say, no, let's not even bother because they might be Islamists. Let's not even bother to send the money. I mean, I'm at that point that I'm worried yeah. about, about. And in fact, I will go even further and say that imagining that Western agencies are <laughs> a piece. Again, I remember when I was in Afghanistan, there was a World Bank report out saying, whatever you do, do not interfere in family. It's their culture. Mm -hmm. Okay? And of course, that's a cop-out, basically, because, because I discovered that a lot of things were not their culture, that people didn't use to sell six-year-old girls to settle opium debts, say, 20 years ago, okay? So when you have the West or Western sources saying it's their culture, be suspicious, be very suspicious, because very likely it's some kind of pathology that was installed as a result of conflict as a result of the disarticulation of these societies. Uh, the uh, Afghanistan society has seen things that it never used to know about before, after, you know, uh, the Taliban came in and so on and so forth. The same in Iraq. The same in Iraq, yeah. you see. So I think that it is time to demand precision and honesty. We are getting into lazy habits. And we have to simply shake ourselves out of that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> so we still have time for more questions and comments. Yes, please. When you said that uh, Islam is being used by the government and by its opponents, it was very accurate, but it's not enough. Because it's not one Islam. You have, I don't know, maybe half a dozen different Islam. You have the very fanatic Salafi Islam, which is being used uh, against women and by women as well. Women sometimes are even their own worst enemies or the enemies of other women. You have the Muslim Brotherhood Islam, which is totally different from the Salafi Islam, even though they both were, are working towards the same aim. Then you have the Cube Islam, which is perpetrated by the um, evangelists, uh, you know, the, the... I'm calling it, I'm, I'm making up these terms now to distinguish, but you have all these, you know, um, very modern sheikhs that appear on television who don't have the beards, they are clean shaven, they're wearing... They're wearing uh, um, open color you know, suits mm -hmm. and polo shirts yeah. and they go to the American University and have workshops with the girls trying to push them into a cute hijab not you're the, referring to the Egyptian content, yeah yeah I think yeah okay. yeah well that's the content I know yeah, yeah sure so of course and then you have uh, the reformist Islam of um, people like uh, I don't know Islam al Bihari who ended up in jail because he wants to change things and let him fatma out and all these guys who have uh, by then women who have the reformist agenda and then you have a culture in Islam which is actually just you know keep things as they are have a mullet here and, and uh, a thing there to keep the population busy and all that so you can't really talk about an Islam that is being used by the government or by the opponents you have so many different uh, Islams that are being used for different aims by different <coughs> people to do different things so you need to also 
kind of restructure. Yes, that's a very fair copy. Yes. yes. <laughs> this was actually one of the main arguments of the original book. Yes. Right? Yes. If I might say. Yeah, so I would like to, I actually want to follow up on this point in a different way, a little in a little provoking way. Because <coughs> the title of the edited volume was Women, Islam and the State. So at the heart of the title we still had Islam, right? Um, so when I was listening to the presentations, it struck me that many of the things that were predicated could be predicated of other non-Muslim majority contexts, right? So in terms of comparative studies then, it would probably make sense to think of um, comparisons mm -hmm. across Muslim majority and non-Muslim majority contexts. So since the decision of revisiting the title within the framework of Muslim majority context, um, how much is that actually defining the actual outcome that you are uh, looking at? Because it somehow undermines a lot of the claims about the universality or the global dynamics mm -hmm. that you're actually referring to, which I think would be fantastic to look at. That's the next book. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's not though. Is it? Is it? And with the Muslim diaspora chapter. So I believe we can have one more question. Yes, please. Okay, sure. I, I just want to, to go back to the very important thing you raised about the, these autonomous individuals, you know, and if we can capture their, you know, moving around uh, around boundaries and about around, you know, nationalities are really autonomous, you know, mm. so autonomous individuals, and we cannot capture uh, or we cannot use the concept of governance to analyze this movement. Here, maybe we can not use the, 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 the formal form of governance or governance, but we should also think in this <coughs> movement in, in the context of different networks, and these people are not really autonomous, in this respect, they are always connected to some form of networks, and these networks, I don't know if they have, you know, a direct links with global governments, you know, because suddenly they emerged in particular countries, in particular uh, places doing, you know, or inflicting atrocities across the places they, they move around, uh, around, and with enormous resources. Enormous. Yes. Mm -hmm. it besides, they themselves practice different forms of governance of in, you know, on the areas they control. Mm -hmm. So I think we still can capture their activism or activities through the concept of government. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, final round? Yes. Uh, yes, this is yep. live. Um, Unless you, do you want to start? It's just that I'm afraid of losing the thread. Uh, I completely agree with that, the comment about the varieties of Islam. Totally. It's a very fair comment. In fact, I can recognize it in the Turkish context. We even have a television, I'm not going to call him a preacher, but he's a very influential man who is a creationist. In fact, he's the world leader of creationism, and he appears on television surrounded by uh, platinum blonde siliconed women in his program. Yes, uh, and, and he claims to be an Islamist. So I totally... Yeah, for real. Yeah. For, yeah, <laughs> I, I really, I could give a counter example for each example you provided, and probably this is something to, to really look at. The question of comparisons, now of course, we are going to look at non-Muslim majority context per force because we have to look at diasporas. So these are very different legislation, legislatures, European mainly. I don't know if Catherine is going to look at the United States as well, but we're definitely going to look at you know, uh, uh, European countries. But the trouble is that it's very difficult to do cross comparisons. For instance, it's very difficult to compare the Catholics. It's easier to compare Ireland and Poland 
because they're both very dominated by the Catholic Church, but the politics is such that you get very different results, with Poland being a version almost of the Iranian Republic as far as I'm concerned, in terms of the role of the state. They have a council of guardians, if you look closely. So that kind of comparison within a religion is much easier than across. And we feel overwhelmed already, I think, looking at, you know, we can barely cope, I can't cope, certainly, you know, with the diversity that we have before us. Now, I think I want to get back to what Islas said, because it's very important. I think what you mean is that certain movements and flows are highly regulated, but you probably hesitate to talk about governance because there is no blueprint. So when you have, a, you know, a political party, it has, a, you know, there is somehow an above the, like the tip of the, above the water level, legible blueprint that explains it. Now, there is no manual to explain how since 1979 fighters, the, the year of 79 is crucial, I call it class of 79 in Afghanistan, have gone to Algeria, we had FIS have gone here, and now indeed we have ISIS with its own method of governance, but how do our people convey? I think we must distinguish maybe, I don't know, I'm just between forms of regulation, you know, which may be totally invisible, informal, I'm literally making this up. This is one thing we have to think about, you know, because there are regularities and flows which only fall within the realm of governance if somebody becomes suddenly subject to refugee law. And then you have refugee law, which is international, and then you have national laws and how these are negotiated. The sort of thing you're thinking about, which is where criminality, the underworld, the secret services of various countries and so on intersect. What are we going to call that? A shadow governance, if you like. I mean, I'm not sure what to call what happens when the ISI, a bunch of opium smugglers and Mujahideen start doing things together. Certainly a lot happens with devastating consequences. One is supposed to be a state institution, you know, the others are supposed to be part of the criminal economy, but it's clear that stuff is going on there. Mm -hmm. Can I say something? Yeah, please do. Uh, in terms of the uh, point that, uh, you know, why don't you look at other contexts that are not uh, Muslim majority contexts? And I, I take your point, but I think it's a it's quite a different project. Um, it's quite a different project that I think needs to be done because, um, I mean, to my mind, some of the the terms that come to mind are not just authoritarianism, but fascism, populism, um, post-truthism, having to rethink what democracy means. And I think it's really important that we take this out of that we really sort of look across. Um, and, and I think that in the context of the Middle East, people don't often use the term fascism. They say, well, you know, that's kind of Western context, but it's actually, I see, you know, there are lots of parallels. And I mean, and the way that uh, gender and sexuality is being instrumentalized in populist discourse, I mean, that cuts across so Everywhere. much. So I think it's, it's really important to do that, but I think it's a, it is a different project looking at, um, the very uh, way that Muslim majority countries have shifted and, you know, the variety in terms of, um, you know, the sort of the focus from the state to co governance, I think that is really important to do comparatively as well. Yeah. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, no, I just, I, I really appreciated your comments and I think that somehow your both comments tie together of, mm -hmm. of looking at these cross currents across states and how they compare. Mm -hmm. So I think that your questions quite tie together. And I think we do need to look at networks are key. 
and the governing structures within these networks, which are not, uh, we can't use the language of civil society or the Plato, it's a different language that needs to be used. Um, and it, I think it's very more communally based, and I think that the authority structures do exist within these networks. I mean, if you look at the, the Shia networks, you know, the, the link to the Marja Taklids, you know, it's very clear governing um, structures, which they're then implemented and very moneyed across locations. And then, you know, and there's expectations about how you should behave within these realms at a community level. So, you know, I think there's a lot of things that go across border, um, which hopefully will come out. It'll be really interesting to see how we dis the discuss discussions turn in the next couple of days, but I hope it comes out more. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, we have to close. We are out of time. Sorry. Please join me in thanking our speakers once again.